Hello, I am Nazi Khanishan from Horizon Weekly, and today we are so lucky to be with author and writer of war fiction, Marsha Fortrick Skripik. Marsha, thank you for making the time to be with us today. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Marsha has published more than 20 books. Her books seem to follow a general theme. They're nearly all about young people plunged in the midst of war or oppression. Her most recent work, um, set during the Armenian Genocide, was published in 2014, Dance of the Banished, uh, which won Jeffrey Bilson Award for Historical Fiction. Um, Marsha has written over six books set during and in the aftermath of the Armenian Genocide, and some of the familiar top titles are The Hunger, Nobody's Child, Called Me Adam, Adam's Choice. Um, her books are available in many countries, have been translated into different languages, and have won lots of awards. Marcia, it's uh, very interesting to see all the books that you have written all over the years. Um, and you state you didn't consciously choose to write about the genocide. Uh, can you share what inspired you to write about these events? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the Armenian Genocide chose me. The very first thing that I started writing before I started writing books was coming to Canada's stories. And I did that as a freelance journalist for a little magazine in Brantford, Ontario called Grand Memories. And one of the very first people that I interviewed was Carl Georgian. And he uh, told me about his father, Kevork Kevorkian, George Georgian, and that um, his father was a Georgetown boy and how he came to Canada, but also why and about the Armenian genocide. And so I wrote that little article and it was published, but I couldn't sleep at night because I did not know about the Armenian genocide before Carl um, had invited me over for that interview. And so it, it, like, it was this responsibility for me because I felt that if something as huge as a genocide of 80% of a population um, was killed, who's going to write about it? And it was my responsibility to write about it. And so at that point, I started to try and do research. Um, it was not an easy thing to do research because I'm talking the late 1980s when uh, I started wanting to write on this topic. And in the late 1980s, that's before the internet. It's mm -hmm. also before um, e-books. So what it meant was that if someone didn't want a certain kind of information known and you went into a library, you couldn't get the books because there would be people who would go in and get all the books and then destroy them, burn them. There would be people who would, uh, when a book was printed on a particular topic, i.e. the Armenian Genocide, there'd be people who would um, buy up the entire print run and destroy them. So how was I to do research? So at the Brantford Public Library, I found one book, and it was The Road From Home by David Kurgan, and that was it. There was also The Rise and Fall of the Ottoman Empire, and in that, there was like one line, and it said, oh, and by the way, some Armenians died too. That was their World War I entrance on Armenians, right? And um, so I was at a loss. So what I did was I wrote a manuscript uh, a novel based on what Carl had told me, what I was able to read on the little bit of stuff that I could get. Um, and then I, I just took that manuscript and I sent it to everybody that was an academic who was Armenian that I could think of. And uh, one of the people uh, called me, like, because I put a phone number, because again, this was the late 1980s. And it was Dorothy Manukian, Montreal. And uh, she called me and she said, who, who told you the women's stories? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, you're, you've written, um, like, and I had to speculate. I had to speculate what happened because I couldn't do the research at that point. And she said, you have told stories in these books, um, like in the story that you've written. And we made a pact that we would not talk about what happened because it was just such an awful thing. And so I admitted to her that I, I just speculated. And I said, I really would like to talk to a survivor um, that is helped me and I would really like books. And so she organized for me to meet Aram Abazian. And so we met and um, he uh, spoke to me at length, first of all, to make sure that I wasn't 
a Turkish spy. And when he felt that I was, um, uh, you know, trustworthy, he took me out to his car and he opened up his trunk and there's a giant wooden box that could have been like a con, right? But he opened it up and it was filled with all of the books that I had been trying to get from the library, but had been destroyed. And he said, open up your trunk, I'm looking for you. But he said, fine, but you, I, you know, you're still my book. He loaded those all into my trunk. And then um, with those books, it helped me so much. But also, um, Aram and I worked together. So um, he would read my manuscript. He was also doing a memoir himself. And I would read his. And we gave each other feedback back and forth and back and forth. And so finally, I was able to write a really good manuscript, I thought. It was 500 pages, but I still didn't know how to write. And that never got published. So the very first book that I ever had published was actually on a, about my Ukrainian grandfather. But I kept on going back to that same topic. And I ended up tearing it apart and making five different books out of it. So the first book was Hunger. Mm -hmm. The next was Mother's Child. The next was Daughter. And then there are still stories left over that didn't really fit in. And those were the Georgetown Boys stories. Aram right. and Call Me Aram. Right, and, and, and you bring the, the books of Aram's Choice and uh, Call Me Autumn as well. And that's a very big part of the Canadian history, um, as well as the Armenian genocide um, yes, story yeah. as well. Um, the, the Georgetown Boy story isn't something that's very um, known or talked about in, in, in general. It, it, it is now, and I think that your books have made a very big impact on that. But could you, could, could you share what really sparked your curiosity to keep going and sharing the story of those boys, those 110 boys? Well, we have a Georgian who is my mentor and my hero, um, but because his father was a Georgetown boy. And mm -hmm. so one of the things that I did when I was doing research that I actually had access to was to go to the Multicultural Historical um, Archives of Ontario, and they had... Uh, taped interviews, oral interviews with many of the Georgetown boys. And uh, so I wasn't allowed to uh, borrow them, but I could sit in the archive and listen to them and take notes. They didn't let me in with my purse. So it was like um, a steno pad and a pen and that was it. And one of them that I listened to was actually um, Carl's father's story. There were many others, but um, there were a number of Georgetown boy uh, memoirs that had been sealed until all of the Georgetown boys had died. Now, there were little crazy things, like I knew what each were about. And so the ones that were sealed were the ones that were the most interesting. And so I wanted to write about the Georgetown boys, but I needed to know what was sealed, what they couldn't talk about. And so um, the last Georgetown boy died, I think, in 2003. And uh, so that's when I went back to the archives and I listened to the rest of um, uh, the, the, the uh, personal memoir. And it was shocking what I learned. And I, then I knew why it had been blocked. And the boys left in 1923. And the reason that they left was because they were fleeing Ataturk. And Ataturk was starting a new genocide all over again and was basically trying to rake up all those refugees, all these little urchins who had been living on the street who were Armenian and kill them. And so they fled. And when they came to Canada, they were afraid to have anybody read their stories until after they were dead because they were afraid of the retribution that they could get. And so that was just shocking in itself. But yes, the Armenian genocide, how many people even know about it now? But then there's the ripple effect of this cleanup operation that is even less known about. So I really had to write about it. Um, but the other thing too, writing a story about a group of refugee boys who came to Canada, because the first ones were all boys, who came to Canada and it was um, Canada's first international relief effort. So that's a piece of history. Um, 
and Canadians and also Canadians of Armenian heritage, but there are a lot of Canadians who are not of Armenian heritage, raised the money to buy the Georgetown farm to bring these boys to Canada and, and to, you know, have them have schooling and to learn how to be farmers, which is another issue, but we won't get into that. But that's a huge piece of Canadian history that, um, that this opened up the floodgate for Canada to be the kind of country that we are, that we welcome people from all different nations and that we are that tall. And so that was a piece of history that was at risk of being lost. And even when Muriel Wood, who did the wonderful illustration in this book, Muriel Wood, she and I went to the Georgetown boys uh, farm because she needed to see as much of the buildings as she could to do the um, illustrations and everything was falling apart. And even the building itself was going to be torn down. And um, so I'm thankful that the book and then also the, the play that was done after brought more attention to the history of the Georgetown boys, because I think that was a large part in the community wanting their heritage not to be erased. And even when the play was being done, it was very interesting because um, children who were playing the parts of the Georgetown boys, they realized um, that their own grandparents had photos of Georgetown boys in their houses, but they didn't know why. And it was just sort of like this ripple effect that um, doing this story that all originated with Carl George in that one you know, first conversation about his father had this huge ripple effect of being able to reclaim Canadian history in addition to Armenian history. Absolutely. It's unraveled a big part of our, our history in general, which is um, very interesting. So, and you've done so much research since the um, 1980s on the Armenian genocide. Um, and you've come across many things that have surprised you, um, that have stood out to you. Can you kind of address a few of the things that you weren't really expecting and that might have really stood out to you on the dark, dark chapter? Well, one of the things, and I'm going to mention this um, a little bit at the beginning, that I couldn't find uh, memoirs written uh, from a female point of view. The memoirs that when I was able to find them, they were all from a male point of view. And that did change after time. Like after I had my first book published, um, The Hunger, after that it was easier to do research and as I did each um, book it was easier to find the research, um, partly because just technology and everything else, but like the, the, the fact that what happened to women was completely hidden, that surprised me. But mm. when I started doing the research for Ants of the Banished, this whole thing just totally like blew my mind. Because um, Dance of the Banished, as I know you know, mm -hmm. is um, actually told from the perspective of uh, two people who are not Armenian. They're actually Alevi Kurds. But Alevi Kurds, in many ways, you know, there's a saying that the difference between an Armenian and an Alevi Kurd is the thickness of a, um, an onion skin. And so many of the Alevi Kurds... Um, lived in the same communities as Armenians and they were witnesses of the genocide. But also I uncovered this, this story that I had no idea about, about the um, Alevi Kurds, a group of them who um, helped our, our Armenians, several thousand, like 38,000 or something like that, escape through the mountains into Imperial Russia. And so this was a story that I had no idea about, but once I, got an inkling of it and I went back through my own research material because I think you probably understand I have a vast amount of research material I've accumulated over years working on this for so long. But I would find mention of them, but I didn't know what they meant by them because terms that were used 105 years ago are different than the terms that they use now. And so it was sort of like the bells going off when I realized that I actually had first person accounts of Armenians being helped through the mountains by these guides. And I didn't know what was being talked about. So that was a huge thing of learning about that. That's very interesting. And I know many of us have our libraries filled with your books. We've accumulated all of your work over the years. Um, and in these um, unprecedented times, we all certainly have the wealth of time to reread or maybe start reading one of the books that um, you've written. Can you advise our followers where they can find your books and how we can purchase your books? 
any um, um, bookstore who will be able to get you of the books. Uh, so chat, uh, if there's an independent bookstore in your um, town that does delivery, that's a really good option because independent bookstores are really, really hurting. Of course, Amazon and chapters, you know, the, the big box ones, but you know, if you've got a local one, um, then they're the very best places to get these books and they'll, you know, either hand deliver them or mail them to you. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm sure in our follower base, we've got a lot of young, talented individuals that might be considering writing or sharing stories as well. Um, what would be a word of advice for you for them to get started um, on how to share their story? So there are things that I would suggest. Okay. Are writer. Um, the very first thing that you need to do if you want to write is you need to read widely. And you need to read widely, not just in, in like uh, books that you know that you really like, but maybe even books on topics that you don't like or um, say you've never read science fiction. Well, read one, read a Western, read um, whatever, fantasy, um, because the more you read, the, like, um, the more your imagination will expand. And if you don't read a lot before you try and write, then you'll just sound like the last person that you read. So, you know, that, that's one thing. The other thing is, if you're interested in writing a book, I would suggest starting today to, to carve out time to write 10 minutes every single day. And it's just like if you want it to be a marathon runner, you wouldn't all of a sudden run 33 kilometers or something like that. So it's the same thing. You have to get your writing muscles. And so writing 10 minutes a day will change your, your, like the whole pathways in your brain and it'll make you a writer. Now, when you're writing and it, when like the hardest thing is confronting a blank page. So what I would suggest that you do when you confront that blank page is put a word down and that word is suddenly. And the reason for that is put the word down suddenly. You're not gonna say a long time ago and blah, 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 boring, boring. You're going to say, suddenly the door burst open or something of action. And then after you get a paragraph or two, you can go up and you can erase the word suddenly, but basically you've started your story in action, which is what you want. So those are my tips. That's very interesting and definitely a good way to get started. So thank you very much, Marcia. Thank you for making the time um, once again to be with us. And uh, we hope to see you in our community in person very soon after all of this is done. Well, and best of this time of quarantine, um, good health and safety for everyone. Thank you.